Um, uh, welcome to the League of American Orchestras National Virtual Conference, Embracing a Change World. My name is James Berry, Senior Manager of Artistic Programs here at the League. Thanks for joining us for this session, Partnering Effectively, where we'll unpack how orchestral EDCE staff and musicians partner most effectively for the benefit of the community and furthering the organization's mission. It gives me great pleasure to welcome the winners of the Ford Musician Awards for Excellence in Community Service, whose work we'll be featuring today. And I wanna take a moment to acknowledge the Ford Motor Company Fund, whose support makes this award program and this session possible. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to hand the session over to Pam Blaine, Chief of Education and Community Engagement at the Houston Symphony, who will lead today's conversation. Over to you, Pam. Thanks, James, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm glad you're all here. We're gonna have a great session, a fairly fast-paced session. And as James said, this is about how musicians and education and community engagement and other members of our staff teams work together collaboratively on education and community engagement initiatives to maximize the impact of them. And today, the goals really inside that are for us to understand what motivates musicians to get involved with education and community engagement work and really hear what inspires them the most about their work. We'll hear about the best practices that they have uh, put in place in their programs and other best practices as they bubble up in the Q&A, we hope. And then also, as I said before, the ways that staff and musicians can collaborate together for maximum impact. The way that the session will flow is we're gonna start out with a very quick spitfire sort of um, rapid fire thumbnail descriptions of each of the five musicians initiatives that they've been awarded this prestigious uh, prize for. And then we'll go in with about two questions for each of them that will delve a little bit into different details around inspiration and um, other aspects of their projects. And then we hope that we will stay on time and leave plenty of time for a Q&A session we know that also as we're going, if you want to pose some questions in the chat or have any kind of dialogue going on there, please feel free. So with that, I want to introduce our panelists. We have Sean Clare from the Knoxville Symphony Orchestra, violinist. We have Jerry, Jeremy Crosmer from the Detroit Symphony, cellist. Lorian Hart from the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra, violin. Miho Hashizume from the Cleveland Orchestra, also a violinist, and John Terman from the Seattle Symphony Orchestra playing uh, the horn. Not today, but in his work with the orchestra. <laughs> so I think, Sean, we'll go in that order. If you wouldn't mind starting out and giving us a very brief description of the initiative that you do in education. Very well, thank you. Thank you so much, Pam, and to James. Um, in Knoxville Symphony, about 18 years ago, there was a question raised at a meeting, what is the music and wellness program? And at this point, we didn't know. So it began simply as playing string quartets in hospital lobbies, and over the last 18 years has progressed to the point where we are able to play for individual patients, in cancer, in chemotherapy, in heart, in uh, the neonatal intensive care unit and physical therapy situations as both ensembles and as soloists. And so we've reached a, a really quite a wonderful saturation, especially with the University of Tennessee Medical Center. Um, and at one point uh, we had a pretty big celebration when we were actually became one of their budget lines, which was a which was a major, uh, major accomplishment. And uh, the most recent accomplishments are a couple of studies. One is an observational study of the emotional impact on patients in waiting areas. And the other was a clinical study in the neonatal intensive care unit. 
that t kept track of the vital signs of infants as music was played for them. So that's a overview of what we've managed to accomplish in the last 18 years. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, Sean. We'll next go to Jeremy. Can you tell us a little bit about your project? Yes, thanks, Pam. Uh, our project is a little bit newer. Uh, for the past three years, Detroit Symphony Orchestra has been partnering with Kadima Mental Health Services, and I've been helping to spearhead that project. Um, we, before the pandemic, we were going to Kadima into their community room and having weekly sessions with about a dozen or so uh, people with mental health disabilities. And during the pandemic, we've been working over Zoom. Um, we were fortunate enough that our participants were provided with iPads so that they could all participate. Um, all of them have different musical backgrounds and some of them have hardly any musical training and others um, have been playing instruments for a while. So uh, it's been an interesting experience to figure out how to interact with all of them. The way that our sessions work is a sort of jam session where people uh, request certain music that they want to play or sing or listen to. Uh, sometimes we bring in other Detroit Symphony musicians to uh, sort of coach or talk about their instrument or showcase a uh, piece that they really enjoy. Um, and we always have board certified music therapists present. Um, we have a lead therapist and she brings an assistant with her so that we cover all of our bases from um, providing this music therapy service to uh, providing a rich musical content. So that's our project. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, let's hear now from Lorian, please. Thanks, Pam. Um, the Body and Soul Partnership with 412 Food Rescue uh, links the entire PSO family to food insecure populations um, in the Pittsburgh area. Um, we have many satellite initiatives, but the heart of the of the partnership is um, is a it started as a monthly thing, but it's been able to expand to uh, well, pre-COVID, twice a month, um, a group of musicians would uh, would uh, accompany the truck, uh, the 412 Food Rescue truck that had picked up at one of our re uh, local wholesalers, um, and it would be pallets of food that would go otherwise into the dumpsters, and we would accompany the truck on the runs, and at each uh, delivery spot, we would help to unload the truck, and then a small group would play um, a 10 to 15 minute concert for the residents. Um, and these communities include Section 8 housing, senior housing, community centers, daycare centers. Um, so it's, uh, and then in the fourth year of the partnership, we were able to start including, um, after we had reached 100% musician participation, we started including PSO staff, uh, board members and donors. Uh, and so now we really have made it into um, a building wide initiative where everybody uh, participates and by coming together to serve our community, the PSO community um, has really come together. Thank you, Lauren. And uh, Miho, could you please describe your project? Yes, um, I'm Miho Hashizume and I'm from the Cleveland Orchestra. And our program started about three years ago and at uh, Mount School, which is located in Slavic village of Cleveland. And Cleveland is very segregated. And the Slavic village, 100 years ago, it was mostly Polish, Hungarian, and Slavic people. But right now, it's predominantly mostly African-American. And it was hit, uh, it got hit hugely in, by the 2008 uh, disclosure of the, the financial thing. So uh, doing the subprime stuff. It's uh, the the area when I started, they told me that the, the lead poisoning in the water pipes are affecting the children's health. And some children has very short um, memory span. They, so it, uh, they, they said that there are about 10% of the students have the um, attention deficit 
or, um, disorders. And the program started like um, I was a supervisor and then they had two, three Suzuki uh, violin teachers who th went there and gave classes and uh, entire second graders started violin lessons two years ago. Right now they are in the fourth grade and uh, from the third grader, they could choose to do this class um, after school so that they signed up to do the classes. And it, it has been great. And I, I was just uh, there for a monthly um, master classes and they had the uh, regular uh, okay. teachers but during the pandemic that's when I started uh, dealing with them more closely since uh, most of the staff members were gone uh, temporarily laid off so um, that's when I got to know each family each family situations and um, dealt with the community more deeply Thank you, Mio. And last but not least, John, could you explain your project? Absolutely. Thanks, Pam. Hi, everyone. My name is John Terman, and uh, can you all hear me? <laughs> okay, great. Um, I am Third Horn in the Seattle Symphony, and I am also the host and producer of Tiny Tots, uh, which is a program that introduces children ages zero to five to the musical instruments and the musicians that play them. So uh, with the help of all my Seattle Symphony colleagues, we would perform uh, essentially chamber music concerts that are surrounded by um, the introduction to basic musical concepts for this age group. And um, this pre-pandemic, this all took place on stage. And so there was a lot of interaction and a lot of games that we would play. Um, together and then uh, when the pandemic hit, we uh, like most orchestras had to take uh, everything virtual. So um, when that happened, I started filming and editing and putting together an online version of Tiny Tots that we called Tiny Clips for Tiny Tots because I would have all my colleagues essentially play along to a click track that I would make and then they would send me all their little clips and we put it together into a virtual performance, hence these uh, little clips. So I'm actually going to drop a little link in the chat if, uh, for a trumpet episode we did about this time last year. So um, if you want to check that out, that's there. And that's my project. I love it. Fantastic. Well, I can tell all five of these projects are really exciting and I think we will learn a lot from hearing more from you about them. And before I go on, I just wanna congratulate all five of you. Perfect, that's so hard to do to boil down your project in such a short, short period of time that we gave you. I'm pleased to say we are on time with this session. So congratulations. And then for those of you who are with us, if you, it's always easier if we're looking at you. So if you are comfortable to the degree that you are, if you wouldn't mind turning your cameras on, we would love to see your beautiful faces. Okay, without further ado, we'll move into the question and answer time for our panelists. John, I want you to go first. And could you please uh, let us know how you got involved with the Tiny Tots program? Yes, so this is, um, it, it was totally reliant on my EDCE team here at the Seattle Symphony. Uh, Laura Reynolds was the head of our department and she approached me uh, a few years ago to ask if I would host this uh, program for early ch early childhood music education. And um, we would just, you know, after like a single rehearsal at the orchestra, I would go down to the EDCE office and we would just turn it into a writer's room and be writing things on the whiteboard of all these goals of education markers that we wanted to meet. And then, you know, a list of all the cool repertoire that we wanted to introduce. Um, because how it worked, we we had uh, access to a, a small chamber ensemble at a time. So, you know, we had a wind quintet, brass quintet, string quartet, percussion trio, and then chamber orchestra. 
um, you know, maybe like a 13 piece ensemble. And so we just got to play around with programming. And when, once we had all the music set, we would write a script together and come up with all these games or, you know, dive into um, our own arrangements of like classic children's songs to um, bring to the stage. It was a very um, effective collaboration with my education team. And what really, <clears throat> what got me into it was just the, the feeling of collaboration. So Laura is a horn player like me and a lot of um, NCE team members, they are musicians. And so finding your section and just kind of getting into the section that um, in starting there is probably my one major piece of advice. If you are kind of nervous about approaching your orchestra, just start with what you know. You know, if, if you are a wind player or, you know, find a couple friends in the orchestra and then start learning everyone's names and um, just hang out backstage, get, you know, go to all the concerts and really be seen by your orchestra and develop that trust and that uh, those channels of communication um, between everyone. Because a lot of musicians, <clears throat> particularly in Seattle, we are all about education. We we really see that as a um, a very valuable thing to us and to our community. And of course, a lot of us teach. A lot of us musicians teach on the side, um, and we jump at the opportunity to get out in the community and do projects like this. So um, don't be shy. It's, it's probably my one piece of advice for the EDCE staff and teams. Um, in terms of starting collaborations with your orchestra members. Uh, anyway, so back to this project. Um, once the pandemic hit, um, you know, we are all scrambling and just figuring out what to do. You know, how do we take this show that, you know, we, we had sold out for a couple of, you know, like all these people had tickets and we were so excited to present all of this. And um, there was just a lot of, I mean, this year is very hard, a lot of sadness, a lot of darkness. And um, I just called up my team and said, hey, so we got to put some Tiny Tots stuff online. Like, how, are, what are we, we going to do? And um, with their help, we started to organize uh, a different format, basically. So we started with our usual chamber ensembles, but then we said, hmm, let's start introducing kids to the sections of the orchestra, like the actual, like, you know, like an oboe trio, you know, the English, the, the double reed section, the bassoon section. And that way, all of the sections got to do, you know, mono section chamber music, which is horn players. We love doing that. Love horn choir stuff. And you love cello choir stuff. All the, all of those um, ensembles got a chance to shine um, during the pandemic. And um, I think that's, that was sort of what the, like the, the impact that the pandemic had. It actually kind of forced us to get a little more creative and learn a lot of new rep and do a lot more research and work on our editing skills and my editing skills and our writing skills and um, learning how to channel, you know, a search engine optimization in order to like reach uh, not just our own community here in Seattle, but um, a lot of, you know, this age group just kind of across, across the world and, um, just trying to bring this joy and happiness and love of music that we had to as many people as possible. And it was, um, it, it did require a lot of technical skill, um, but, you know, there was so much time just sort of available at the beginning of the pandemic that um, I just got on YouTube and just started watching videos like how to make a green screen video, how to uh, record yourself with correct audio, how to make a click track, how to put, you know, a virtual performance together, just hours and hours of R&D on uh, YouTube, figuring out all this stuff. And I feel that anyone can do it. It just kind of, you just got to get on YouTube and just start researching and learning and, um, just picking a few projects to start with. And I, one thing I wouldn't recommend is that uh, we were doing one show, one 20 minute show episode each week. And it was pretty brutal, but we were just so like, this is one of our favorite shows. And we really loved seeing the response from the community. And um, we loved 
that everyone kind of wanted to get in on it. Everyone, the, the flutes were like, okay, well, when are we going to come up in the clarinet section? All that, everyone was just kind of texting me and asking, you know, what rep they could do. And it was just a really fun project that everyone was uh, getting behind. So super thankful to my colleagues and, and very thankful to my NCE staff and team for um, a production and writing and everything. John, thank you. Boy, I love your passion. I love the proactivity. You jumped right in, it sounds like from the beginning, and you know, searched out the opportunity to work with your staff colleagues, but also recruiting your musicians and, and your colleagues and, and spreading the great passion around and the impact of what could happen. Congratulations. That is a lot of great work and great things that we can learn from as a result. Moving on now to Lorian. Lorian, can you tell us what you were looking to accomplish when you first started this? Because this came directly from you. And I'm curious what you were looking to accomplish and how you chose the specific partner that you ended up working with. Sure, Pam. Um, so our project is different, like you said, in that it started as a musician initiative um, and has through time expanded to include the whole PSO family. Uh, so in uh, 2016, uh, we were looking for something that the musicians um, could, could do in, in our community. We were looking for a way to reach out into our community. Um, and there was also in 2016, a brand new nonprofit in town called 412 Food Rescue. And we really didn't know much about it. But we reached out to them and he said, and we said, hey, can we do something with you? And they said, absolutely. Um, so our first run with them was actually with, with no instruments. It was just a group of musicians who, who followed the truck around one day and helped deliver. And uh, it, was, it was a really eye-opening afternoon. We were in um, McKeesport, which is one of our many... Um, previous steel town. Uh, they were once thriving communities and are now ghost towns. Um, and we went from, we visited Section 8 housing, we visited uh, some senior centers and a daycare center. And everywhere we went, we offered tickets to the Pittsburgh Symphony. And people were excited, except no one took us up on these, on these tickets. And what we realized quickly was it wasn't we, we all think that it's the cost of admission or something like that. And we realized it was really a myriad reasons. It was that they didn't feel comfortable in a concert hall. It's that they didn't necessarily know what they might wear. It's that they didn't have a way to get there. Um, it was all sorts of reasons. And so for us, that was an aha moment where we said to ourselves, well, we can not just deliver this food, but we can bring something else. We can bring world-class chamber music to these communities. And so I met with 412 Food Rescue the next month um, and we created the Body and Soul Partnership, uh, which started, like I said, once monthly, we would go and different routes every time. So really exploring all of the little nooks and crannies of the Pittsburgh region. Um, and it just turned into this amazing way to feed both the body and soul um, of our fellow Pittsburghers. So that's how we got started. Fantastic, so inspiring, such an important community need. And I'm curious too, you, I, I wanna draw out something you said that at first it was you going to support that organization's mission with not, not playing. And I'm so curious, you said that you got up to 100% musician participation in your earlier remarks. How did you convince your colleagues to start out with not playing music? So it wasn't long before we started playing music. It really, we only did one that didn't include music. So that was just five or six of them. Um, and then, uh, so starting really with the second run, we were playing chamber music. Um, and at first people weren't really sure. I had a real, I had a small core of devoted um, volunteers who, who were, who said anytime, count me in. Um, but the more people heard about it because it's, it's a truly a life altering experience to go on one of these runs. 
um, to really see your music making, to, to be face to face with the difference that your, your music can make. Um, and so, and one thing that, that we say, that I say with the people in 412 Food Rescue is there's no dignity in a handout. It doesn't matter how much you need it, there is no dignity in it. But adding the elevation, elevating that process of, of, of giving food to these communities that need it, elevated that moment into a special event instead of a handout. And so for all of us, it really turned it into a community building event where just like in the concert hall, it's, it's a symbiotic relationship between us and our audiences um, that exists, you know, in, in the parking lot of a Section 8 housing community or in the gym of a community center or in the community room of a senior center. And so we were able to, the excitement that my colleagues uh, experienced by doing it um, was was contagious. And so they would tell other people about it and they'd say, you have to go do this, you have to go do this. And so 100% participation, it took us um, just over four years to get that um, because they're small groups um, and uh, not everybody's available and all of that. But uh, with some some determination, we, we made sure that we reached 100% participation and really most people say, anytime you call me. Um, and so when we expanded it out to the, to the staff and the board, again, we had, by that point, they knew about it and they had heard about it. And, and we, we have more, more volunteers than we can, than we can accommodate. Uh, so we're excited to get back into things now as we're coming out of COVID. Fantastic. So inspiring. I loved what you had to say about the handout and how this elevated the experience beyond that. And that is really something for us all to think about. I, that's going to sit there for me for a while. I really enjoyed that. Um, you know, Miho, you had some uh, equally, I think, I don't want to put words in your mouth because I'm sure you're going to go here, but the personal impact, the reward, the intrinsic reward of the work that you've done with um, the Mound School. Could you just give us a sense of when you first started the work and how your approach to the work has changed over time? Sure. Um... Thank you. So I, I totally have a um, similar experience to Lorian. Like when I was listening to her, I, I, had a, uh, I had a chance to play in Slavic Village in the morning and then dealing with the children. And then in the evening, I would go to like the board members and then doing the same thing, but just walking through different world but then everybody enjoys the music in the same way it's just like it makes me think about what human is and like how equal we are but um so my work started as just as supervisor and it was initially very limited i mean i i, I went there monthly and so I had some successes, but then the, I had I also had some huge failures to um, not be able to communicate with these children because they are very restless, oh and I didn't know how to effectively communicate with them. So, um, but then I i love that age group it was a uh, second grader to third graders and then so i continued doing that and i totally appreciated that the etsy people didn't fire me for <laughs> during my tests runs and um but then during the pandemic it that's when i actually dealt with them when the all the staff members left and i felt like it was my responsibility to continue the program. Although before the, um, before they had to leave on the, uh, I, April 1st, I think, and before they left, they prepared an app 
for the students to log into. And but when I logged in to watch the activities, the um, the kids were not signing in. And there were about 30 plus students, but then only one or two would show up. So I just learned that the, it, it wasn't working. And that's when I started calling each family. And in, in April 2020, it was like everything was stopped, you know, <laughs> and I and I didn't have to, I didn't have my services either. So I, and I was the only one who is with a reduced salary anyway. I was lucky enough to have that salary. So I just wanted to do something for the community. So I, I kind of designated myself into this position of continuing this program because I felt strongly about it. So um, when I called each family, um, they were great and um, they were really enthusiastic, but they could not do, on, like when I say, can we do online lessons? They, they kind of say, oh, like they don't exactly say it, but they cannot do it for some one reason or another, but they wouldn't say it. But then um, it was actually that the, they had the internet problems. And, but then phone was the only certain way, like that was the only way for me to connect with those people. So um, I started organizing the driveway lessons and um, parking lot classes for kids to come to. And then that was when I actually, the, there was learning experience for me too, that the, when I could deal with each individual's they gave me ideas how to teach them and how to communicate with them. And then I actually got a little more success with teaching them. Um, I developed that I did some, the, because they, these are the kids that the, who has very short attention span. So I did something like um, um, violin baseball. So you would have a base from the home base to first base to and then so you do only two measures, play two measures and then play another two measures in another base and then play two measures in another base. And then you, you just go, if you play the whole tune, you'll be a home run. You can't just come back to the home base. So things like that. I just developed some things like that. Great. And I think that, you know, what I'm cluing in on is that you were getting into, as you got to know them, especially in, during COVID, when you were going in and really working with them individually, and it was just you doing private lessons on their porches and getting small groups together, you were getting to know them much more personally than you had before COVID. And it sounds like you were able to ascertain, oh, they know about baseball. This is something that I know I can connect with them. So I'm gonna adjust my teaching. Am I, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Something um, that we know, oh, go ahead. Yeah, so, um, but then the, uh, what I had to say is that the, um, the with my relationship with the HCE person, Courtney, that um, sh she is very passionate about the program and she really helped build the connection between the family. Um, so it was crucial for me to, that the, when I went there, that, that they, they, already had built that trust already by then. So it was easy for me to connect with them. So they, they knew who I was, they knew what the program was, and then they were, and then I think that was something that the Courtney did before the pandemic. So that was part of my success was um, because of her passion and then her engagement with each family. And she, she is a, a education specialist herself. So um, she, she did an a incredible job on that. And the other thing that I need to add to that is that um, it, it is difficult 
work that uh, uh, when you're dealing with this unstable families and the family situations where um, there are a lot of single moms working night shifts and a um, lot of broken families and one child ha- goes to like each week he would go to mom's house, father's house, grandma's house. And then sometimes we cannot catch him. Like where, like where is he? And, then, and I have to deliver the violin from father's house to the grandma's house to, and that kind of thing. And then there was um, all kinds of just dealing with the difficult family situations. The dealing with the children means dealing with the families really. And um, it was really uh, emotionally taxing sometimes. And uh, Courtney and I, I shared those, and then we shared the concerns about the families. And it was, it, it, it is really important for to have each other, <laughs> so that, that we can uh, keep going. Because sometimes we just. Um, I, I just worry about them at night and like what's going to happen to this child or uh, it's hard to, you know, keep separate from that program to my life. Like it, it is close by and I, they are my neighbors and, you know, so um, it was wonderful to have her um, as the HCE person. Fantastic. Oh my gosh. How inspiring, Miho. I, you know, the, it sounds like you pour yourself into that emotionally. And it also sounds like you've got a fantastic working relationship and an opportunity to lean with your education and community engagement staff, in particular, Courtney, on one another, because it's a little bit emotional, uh, this kind of work, and you need to actually have another person to bounce off of, and also just an ear, as well well as you're achieving something higher than you could have if you were just working in isolation. So thank you for explaining all that. It's fantastic. Uh, Sean, can you talk about the, I know you've got an incredibly exciting project as well. Can you talk about how you, what motivated you to get involved in your project? Absolutely. Um, The genesis in my heart of this project uh, came from training very early on from my parents and knowledge that they gave me about the vibrational impact of good music. Um, One of the things that they cited to me when I was a child was plant study that was done. And I cannot remember the name of the study uh, of the researcher who did it, but she had plants in four different situations. There was of course the control room. There was a classical music room. There was a Indian classical music room, Ravi Shankar, ragas, etc., this kind of thing, and a rock and roll room. And the plants grew second best in classical, best in Indian classical. Unfortunately, they died in the rock and roll room. And that really made an impression on me about the vibrational impact that music has. Um, and when I was uh, in my early 20, no, late teens, I had a back problem. So I was waiting in the backyard of my chiropractor. And I just started practicing because I needed to practice for a recital or something. And after 10 minutes or so, when it was my turn for the appointment, my chiropractor came out of his converted garage office into his backyard, walked up to me and said, as soon as you started playing, the energy blockage in this patient's situation evaporated and I was able to tap in and solve the problem. And so when it came time back in 2003 to sit down and figure out what a music and wellness program was going to be in Knoxville, I jumped on that train as hard and fast as I could. I hope I didn't take it too far off the tracks when I did that. But (laughs) Um, so that was the genesis for me of my interest in the program. And Continuing from there, I was always very much uh, enamored of the idea of somehow working with a music therapist so that we could focus a little bit more our, our um, efforts in individualized work. And so over time, the 
the program progressed from just simply string quartets in lobbies and waiting areas to the point where in inpatient areas, it, we tried some ensembles, but it was a little bit clumsy because the areas were small, cramped. We even had, had a string quartet playing in a nurse's station at one point, which, well, it got in the way of their computer work so that, and they couldn't get to their computers. So we nixed that idea. And so I started to use, they started to utilize my, my ability for a strolling violinist to go around to the inpatient rooms. Uh, and if they invited me in to play, I would play for them. Um, the next step after that was individualized training. There were several of our musicians who went through the Music for Healing and Transition program training. And that is a program that uses music as in the moment care for the patient based on their needs and their responses. And there, it's important to differentiate between therapeutic music, which is what that is, and music therapy, which is a targeted result-based um, approach. So very, very different. Um, so I went through that training and that enables me to watch a patient to understand at least to some degree their facial responses, their emotional responses, and respond to those with types of music that might be more appropriate in that particular moment, either for them or for their family members that are, that are in the area. Um, and so it has evolved from that, as I mentioned er in the uh, er early part uh, of the, the thumbnail sketch in the beginning, to the point where we have a music therapist that we have had on staff for some time and has resulted in a couple of, of studies, one observational and one clinical study, the observational study about the emotional responses of patients in a waiting area, and the clinical study uh, with the neonatal intensive care unit, looking at their vital signs, the, the infant's vital signs as music is played for them. So that's a, a pretty in-depth progression that's happened over the last 18 years with this program. Um, unfortunately, during the pandemic, well, in-person hospital visits pretty much shut down. We just weren't able to do much at that point. But now that that's over, we'll be resuming in the fall with our regular schedule, hopefully, of, of our usual hospital visits and all should be fine. Wow, inspiring. Yes, it'll come back, I'm sure. It's probably not too long, hopefully, down the road before you can get back in person. But I will just say, you, it's amazing. You've been involved since 2003? Yes, Gosh. That's, that's when that, oh, and I have to, I have to say, that, okay, so in 2003, the meeting, and I mentioned this in the beginning too, our former music director, Lucas Richmond, who came from Pittsburgh, um, kudos to the Penny Anderson Brill in Br Pittsburgh for her work with music and wellness as well. But he came to Knoxville with the idea, let's start a music and wellness program. Well, what's that? Let's find out. And our director of education, Jennifer Harrell, took that set of reins and sent that horse off at a gallop. She has been the one that has been instrumental in developing this program to the point where we're able to do these types of things without her assistance and her leadership, I should say, not just assistance, forget that, leadership. Without her leadership, this would not have reached the uh, level of, of depth that it has. Great, wow. Such an amazing evolution of a project that started out small and then just got deeper and deeper and deeper. And I mm -hmm. think that the idea also I wanna draw out there was uh, your willingness and your colleagues' willingness to say when it got so intense, yep, we're gonna even spend some of our time on professional development. We're willing to learn some new skills and go even deeper into this because this is the direction the project's going. So. Again, my gosh, it's a long, fantastic way to be involved. And I'm glad to hear of the fantastic collaboration between you and Jennifer. I'm a big fan, Jennifer. Um, now I'm gonna move on uh, finally to Jeremy. You know, I've heard 
a lot of different threads that I know uh, are applying to the work that you're doing and you're doing amazing work in Detroit. Could you talk a little bit about if you had, um, well, you do, you have this whole audience in front of you. What are the tips and advice that you would give to all of us who are working in community engagement work with an education, but also to your colleagues, your musician colleagues? Yeah, I would love to. And first of all, I just have to say all of us have started from completely different places. Uh, my origin story for this project is um, tied to the Ford Award, actually. Um, so back in 2017, I was in Grand Rapids Symphony. Well, I was there a, a little bit earlier and helping out with a project started by Diane McElfish Helly who um, her project was a music for health initiative, uh, which involves music therapists and playing in cancer centers and neuro rehab centers and the children's hospital. And I was the resident composer. So I helped get music uh, arranged for those sessions. Um, and she utilized my talent on cello as well. Um, and so I helped her start that project. And then when I came to the Detroit Symphony, um, I was lucky that my colleagues in the EDCE staff um, knew a little bit about what I had been doing and knew of my talents. And so our um, Claire Valenti, who is now our um, manager of community engagement, approached me with this project with Kadima. And it just happened to be, in a way, a sort of providence that um, we had all of the right people and just needed to put the puzzle pieces together. And so she approached me and said, okay, I have this project and what can you do with it? And my first piece of advice, of course, was, well, let's get a music therapist involved because I had been working with music therapists in Grand Rapids. And I knew that there's so much, you know, as much as we talk about um, how great classical music is and how much it can do for people, um, board certified music therapists have done studies and they have um, done years of schooling and they know um, just exactly what minor things to change in order to make uh, an effective change in someone. And so, so some examples in Grand Rapids um, in the Neuro Rehab Center, there were people who could hardly move their bodies. And so we would play music that um, like say we would play a scale to help them learn how to move their arm. When the scale goes up, they move their arm up. When the scale goes down, they move their arm down. And sometimes it was just a matter of being able to wiggle fingers. And we did trills for that. Um, in Detroit for the Kadima project, um, the, because it was working with a mental health service, some of the things that we did were um, to help people calm their nerves. I can't tell you how many um, people we had in our group who had never performed before, but were very eager to. They just, they didn't have the confidence or they didn't have the opportunity. And so one of the main things that we did is at the end of every um, semester, sort of 12 week session, um, we would bring them to orchestra hall to perform in front of their family and friends. So an audience that they are comfortable with and um, there would be DSO musicians side by side with them so that um, you know, they have this support from people. Um, I was the only string player in the group for a little while. And so when there was a violinist who was very nervous um, for her first performance, I worked up some duets with her and she brought her family and she got to perform with her DSO buddy. Um, and we took a lot of pictures together and her family and, and herself, she was so happy to be able to do that. Um, my main piece of advice that, that I can give for you is um, if you're interested in doing projects like this, look for a need in your community. And so you've heard of um, so many great projects so far. Hopefully you've seen some of our videos and looked um, back to the previous award winners, or maybe you were um, at some of the previous conferences. But ask yourself, you know, every community is different. Um, mental health in, in Detroit, it happened to be a great fit. Um, but what other categories could you think of where in your particular city or, or community, um, there is a need? So for example, we have food insecurity, 
um, music education, racial equity, um, wellness, poverty and income inequality, or um, incarceration and rehabilitation. Um, so those are just a few examples. And I'm, I'm proud to say that Detroit Symphony has programs in almost all of these categories. Um, so identify the need first, um, and then look for people who have those skills or the necessary skills, um, the necessary knowledge, the necessary um, degrees. So in my case, finding a music therapist who, who um, you know, <laughs> can deal with those difficult situations that, that we face when we're dealing with mental health issues um, and then get a group together. You know, I'm so proud of the DSO, um, the EDCE staff, um, Kirsten Alcorn and of course, Claire, um, they've done so much. They're very proactive about things and that's something that's great to have. I think, um, someone else had mentioned just don't be afraid to share your ideas um i i think that might have been john and i completely agree um just put your ideas out there um <laughs> you know the law of attraction just put your ideas out into the world and someone will come and say oh yeah i remember when that that person was very interested in a project and um uh and they have these skills i have skills as a composer um and I've worked with music therapists, so I just happen to be a great fit. Perfect. And I think you also mentioned something earlier uh, when we were preparing adaptability, flexibility, openness, and empathy. And I, clearly you have those in spades. So thank you very much. Panelists, you've done such an amazing job giving us so much to think about and talk about. We don't have a, I thought we would be having more time for Q&A, but at least there's some really good ones in the chat. I wanna um, pull out one for those of you who are, and maybe this can go in the chat to the answers. Actually, I, actually, I think this would be great from the EDCE people that are in the room to talk uh, about how they're focused in funding, how they're funding these initiatives. Um, any ideas that you could share with one another in the chat would be great. I also want to see, for those of you, the panelists in the room, did you do this out of the kindness of your heart as a volunteer, or did you actually get paid for the work? How many did it as a volunteer? A little bit. And then how many got paid extra? Okay. So it's a mix there. And, um, you know, not, I, I'm not necessarily advocating that you do it for free. Please don't misunderstand me. But I, I'm doing this because there's some per service people that are asking, how do you fund it? What's the expense? Um, besides the panelists that have any things that they don't want to put in the chat about funding, but you want to say? Yeah, Pam? Yeah. Yes, um, you, you were talking about, about the funding thing. Um, I, thought I sort of fall in between. I didn't get paid extra for it, but it's part of my core salary. And so we, we fit all of these services in our uh, structure of our core musicians in Knoxville when we, when we did this program. And for all of our small ensemble services, just is one facet of those. Um, so I don't know if that helps, but... Yeah, and I would say there's probably, this is appearing in the chat and I'm not entirely keeping up, but I do know from my experience that if you have a real community need, like um, Jeremy was talking about, if there's a real solid community need and you're able to jump in there and actually make a difference inside that and you can talk about that, the funding will come, I find. You just have to find the right source, whether they're being paid salaried or, or not. You know, there's, there's good support there. Uh, if you can dig a little and just make your case. Uh, what other questions do we have? Training, I think that, um, what was the question in particular about training? I think this came from Tiffany. Yeah, I was just curious um, what type of professional development the musicians uh, received for going into vulnerable communities. Anybody? have some thoughts there i just put my answer in the chat but uh, dso especially the past couple of years has been providing a lot of training because we've been in such unique situations 
Um, I'm playing a, a sensory friendly concert on Thursday. And so we had a training session in autism awareness just last week. I can't say how vital that is. You know, even if as a musician, we're on stage and not necessarily interacting with people, um, that training is invaluable. And especially for these sessions, like going out into the community and working one-on-one -on -one with people, um, or in a very small group, it's so important to have training. Um, I will. I I just ahead, like to say from a from a musician's perspective, um, because our partnership isn't through um, the PSO. I actually in in my work with Four and Two Food Rescue have kind of created a, a training for the musicians that come along, um, because it is important that they understand that they're entering a different world. Um, maybe with different expectations um, and different rules. Um, and for us, especially, uh, there's a, um, we, we have a rule that if somebody in the community wants to help with the unloading of the truck, that we have to step aside because that is their way of maybe earning the, the handout. Um, and so there's a lot, we have a whole kind of protocol that I've developed, but it's not something, but it's something that I developed with 412 Food Rescue. And I have found some um, willingness on partners when you go into a new partnership and you find that it's the match that they really want and see music. And so you're finding that's a good fit. You know, we're not asking them for any money and they can often come in and provide us great professional development about the population that they serve uniquely. That's something that's happened for me. And I'm sure there are other ideas that people can put in the chat. Who has a question that hasn't answered, asked it through the chat? Anybody? Well, there have to be some questions. Okay, so I'm gonna ask my EDCE colleagues there have been different things that are popping up and that different musicians have touched on. What, in your opinion, that you think about in education and community engagement, what things haven't been mentioned that you think make for a great initiative? We talked about community need, music, professional development, funding, inspiration. I, I think there needs to be ownership on the part of the musicians doing the services. I think for, I think that's how we achieved 100% participation was that there was ownership on part of the musicians and that it was something that they personally were passionate about. And I think that that's really important, whether it's coming from the musicians or coming from education and outreach, that there is ownership on behalf of the people doing the services. Well, fantastic. I feel like this has been, a, uh, I hope, a valuable, it certainly has been for me, uh, discussion today. It's so important that musicians and education and community engagement staff work together. Clearly, we can achieve more together than separately. And it's so fascinating to see all the different ways that you've engaged, all the different origin stories for the projects. But yes, we're seeing, I think, as a major common factor, the, the heart and soul and commitment and flexibility and willingness to just open up and learn new things and just serve the community is so evident amongst the five of you. And I'm confident in many of the people that are in the audience today. So. And I know that that same is true for my colleagues in education and community engagement. It takes all our heart and soul and time and energy and commitment and flexibility and working with each other. So I am really at time. I want to thank everybody for being here and have a great rest of your conference. Thank you, Pam. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Pam. Thank Bye, you. everybody. Bye. Thank you, everyone.